So Zeke, you were supposed to come over tonight and I was going to give you a whole bunch of samples and I gave them, I have them sitting in a Lululemon bag for you because I know how much you love that store. I have never worn anything Lululu. Neither have I, but I had a bag in the house for clothes that I don't own. They're not my clothes, but I know how much you love the bag. That just sounds like a, you know, a scapegoat kind of move. Like that Starbucks, that's not in my cup. I didn't drink it. I don't know how it got in my truck. I told you I drink black coffee from Starbucks. And you also like Lulu lemon. <laughs> you think whatever you want to think. Nice hat there. Look here, this thing looks nice now. This is what got us a bottle of uh, Maker's LE. You sold out, now you got to wear the hat in order to get the bottle? I was told, if you want the bottle, wear the hat. The hat will get me places. And I was like, okay, cool. So are you going to try this, or are you going to go around town wearing the hat and see if you get stuff? Everyone, my name is John Edwards, and with me as always is Zeke Baker, and together we make the Dad's Drinking Bourbon. Wherever you are, whatever time it is, thank you for making us a part of your day. Hello, hello, Zeke Baker. You are in rare form tonight. You're game, you're ready to go, and it must be because we have a guest. Man, I'm feisty. I'm, I'm not going to lie. And we had the briefest like pre-interview call ever with this guest and it got me the most excited i've probably been um i'm I'm stoked here i am super stoked too partly because i was on for another 15 minutes because you were late and i was reminiscing with her about all awesome places in lexington kentucky this is jane bowie the director of innovation master of maturation at maker's mark we are going to get to her here in a second first i gotta let you know today's show is sponsored by cascartel.com changing the industry standard as to how you get your alcohol they are like the amazon of the spirits industry and they will hook you up with merchants that will send whiskey liquor whatever it is directly to your door it's allocation season it's a convenience thing so obviously those allocated bottles are going to cost a little bit more from cascartel because you're not waiting in a line you're not camping out overnight but if you have the money and want to spend it go to cascartel.com their daily drinkers are on par with what you would get at the store also follow them on instagram at cascartel today's show is also sponsored by our friends at premiumbarproducts.com the place where you can get the official dad's drinking bourbon run karen as well as awesome laser etch glassware and bar tools go ahead and check them out at premiumbarproducts.com and if you are a distillery or a bourbon group or a store and you have a wholesale order they have great prices and great glasses like the glen the wee glen the kenzie dram the tipsy dram all sorts of good stuff the tua over at premiumbarproducts.com without further ado i am so pumped to have her on because she is one of the coolest people i think i have ever got to talk to and we've only got to talk to her twice so far i just can't wait to hang out and share a pour with her in person but jane bowie from makers mark welcome to the show thanks guys no no pressure i I gotta start off with um zeke in the few moments i've known you influencer doesn't come to the top of my list but apparently with the hat like the hat it makes you an influencer is that what they're called is that what's happening john is the influencer (laughs) out of this group I, I'm the the anti influencer. People laugh at my tasty notes. It's fine. I tend to go against the curve to a degree, and my hat selection is, is very particular. You're like they gave me a hat to get stuff, so you're like an influencer that's gonna like Instagram your hat. <laughs> I will tell you that as a, a point of reference, though, I we always hate that term influencer. I think through the podcast, we have influence, but there is a connotation of influencer that you're going to be swayed by certain things. And I think you're getting me on a whole soapbox for something else. But in whiskey, totally you were teasing. being funny and I was being serious, but I think there is a difference in the whiskey community with the term influencer. And for some reason, we really don't like it. It's an interesting marketing strategy. There is a bit of ickiness with it, I think. It's not 
something I understand. I'm very much a grandma, like social media is not my thing, but um, yeah, it seems to work, especially other markets. It's interesting cities you go to where that is like a very clear strategy. If anything, like John catches hell from this because I'm an (laughs) anti-influencer. And so when I randomly post something, which is like literally once every two to three months, he gets all the flack and all the PMs of like, oh, what are you drinking? Where'd you find this bottle? Like, that's a unicorn. Like, why are you promoting this? And he's just like, look, it's Zeke being dumb. Sorry. How Zeke do trolls like me it? a lot and people mistake that for influencing. I really think, I don't want to stay on this topic for too long. I don't think Zeke understands what an influencer is because <laughs> what he's talking about has nothing to do with an influencer. Um, I do understand. It means you get a hundred PMs and I get zero. No, that has nothing to do with being an influencer. It does. I influence your PM and that makes my life happy. No, an influencer would be like maker's mark pays you to wear the hat in a picture holding the limited edition ball. Because you have like 20 million Instagram followers or something. That would be an influencer and we do not take money from the brands for zeke to wear a black hat we do take lunch though we do take lunch that's just because we enjoy the conversations (laughs) jane we really love that you came on because you have i want to get into your history and how you joined the brand but i do want to start it off for people that don't know a lot about maker's mark and i'm going to let you go more into the history 2010 was the first year that maker's mark developed a brand new product and they had been around for years and years and years and that was makers 46 then you come along you joined in 2006 Private Select came about in 2015. You had a big part of that. And now there are limited edition releases. And as director of innovation, yes, you work with a team. There's a whole bunch of people there. But we are talking to you are the impetus behind a lot of this stuff that's going on at Makers. So talk a little bit about how you fell into that role in the first place, because you have a long story. Yeah. So the innovation role, I'm the first person to have that role. I always laugh like I'm not winning homecoming at Makers. I'm not. We're in a distillery that like 272 people go, we're making this one thing and they don't want to change it and we like it how it is. But I joined at the beginning of 2007 and I was home in Kentucky. I'd been living in Asia. I'd been backpacking and I'd come home and I was at you know my mom's house saving money, trying to figure out you know, what I was going to do, what the next step was. I I wanted to go be a a rafting guide in New Zealand. Not that I know how to raft. Um, And I, you know, woke up one morning and my mom had cut out a newspaper clipping. Uh, Not so subtly, that was a job advertisement and event coordinator at Maker's Mark. And I'm showing my age. Who advertises in the newspaper for jobs now? And she said, I think you should apply for this. Meaning, like, get off your ass and go get a job. uh, Like a real job. So... I, to kind of appease my mom, I wrote a cover letter and I said, dear Mr. Samuels, I don't want this job. (laughs) And then I went into basically why I didn't want that job, why I would have been a bad fit for that job. And then I pitched them on a job. I had graduated from college in 2003 and I had been traveling and working and saving money and living out of a 40 liter backpack. And so I pitched them on a job and they called. Rob Samuels called and said, hi, I'm Rob Samuels, and I'm the grandson of the founders of Baker's Mark, and I'm looking to start seeding the brand internationally, and your resume got passed to me. Would you like to come meet? And I was like, is this a joke? Like, what's happening? And I went in, and three interviews later, Rob Samuels and I made up the, the global department at Baker's Mark, and... I spent the first year, I worked in nine different countries, and I we were really just starting to see the brand internationally. It was a really interesting time. We weren't exporting hardly anything at all. We started exporting kind of the 90s, but there wasn't, you know, it was little bits here and there just to kind of get a distributor, get a foothold, not doing a lot. 
And I would go into these countries, like I would go live in Australia for a month and train distributors and whatever it was, like Spain, here's how you open a bottle of Makers. It was random stuff wherever you went. I did that job for a full year and then I moved to London full time and was based in the UK, working in Europe, building the brand in the UK primarily. And then, um, as you guys know, the bourbon boom happened, right? About 10 years ago. And everything went nuts. And Rob called one day and was like, look, the bourbon market's blowing up. Like you need to come home. Like we're going to focus on the U S like we can't meet demand. We can't do anything. Every It's going nuts. You need to come home. So that was in 2012. I came home and I had this kind of hybrid role. I was still doing ambassador work, but the state of Kentucky is, you know, the backyard's really important in our industry. As you know, you live in Kentucky. They said, like, we want you to do this kind of hybrid role, like manage the state, the business here, really, you know, learn some different parts of the business. And I did that. And the dream, the thing about being a brand ambassador, and I don't know how many brand, I know you guys talk to a lot of different people. It's this weird job that you kind of have a foot in sales, you kind of have a foot in marketing, and you you better know operations enough to not look like an idiot, right? And especially today, there's people like you all that know so much. You know, I learn something every time I, I talk to anyone that is passionate about our industry. You meet amazing people who love the industry and they know the history and they, they know their stuff. Like you can't bullshit your way through anymore. So when you started looking at career trajectory, I kind of went, oh, I don't think I could do sales. Like, I, I don't know how to go be like, I love this salmon flavored vodka. Like, I can't do that. I hear that thing is amazing in Bloody Mary's. I, salmon I, flavored vodka. I've never had salmon flavored vodka. I shouldn't no, judge. You I've never it. had it, but our, our good friend Prof says that when the rep's there and he puts the salmon flavored vodka in a Bloody Mary mix... That he sells cases. Is that like pickle flavor whiskey? No. But I mean, there's some weird ass flavors that are coming out lately, like banana flavor whiskey. I do love the peanut butter whiskey. There's nothing off limits at this point. There was pumpkin flavored, which we both endorsed. It was You're actually. I'm kidding. <laughs> no, literally, like I laughed. I was like. It doesn't taste like pumpkin, but it's like banana nut bread. Like this would go great with anything fall. Like it was like a spice cake whiskey or something. Oh, I mean, like I don't drink coffee, but John does. And I'm like, this might help your palate finally. It tasted a lot more like banana bread from Starbucks than pumpkin (laughs) bread. I haven't tried that. I'm out of the loop. Long story short, so brand ambassador wasn't necessarily the right role for you, and no, you're not going to go be a market rep and handle all that other stuff. It was the dream was I want to make whiskey. Um, I don't know how to make. I'm not a chemical engineer. I'm not a biologist. I'm not a chemist. I don't have science. And and then when I started learning kind of what a distiller did, it's amazing. But I'm like, that's not my skill set, and I don't have the discipline of routine and. And so I was like, is there a job that, is there someone that decides like what whiskey goes in the bottle? Like, I want to be that person. And so they're like, no, we don't really do that here. And, and yeah, it just, I nagged a lot. I nagged a whole lot. And, and when we released castering after the deep roofing and we said, okay, the deep roofing was a failure. We'll go castering. Um, That was the first project I worked on. And then right after that, Rob was like, do you want to figure out if we did a single barrel program? How would we do it that would make sense for us? And I was like, yeah, that sounds amazing. And that was it. So Did you write him another cover letter or was it just talking (laughs) to him? No, at that point, we just had meetings. Um, (laughs) And so I started doing innovation in 2014. And then it didn't become like a real job. I did it kind of on the side. And then it became a real job for me about probably the last two years. No, the sense of urgency, like I, I get it. I, I dated a girl once and literally she told me that persistence was the key to getting everything she wanted in life. You don't get it if you don't ask. Exactly. I think the cooler thing is that not only did you carve out one role for yourself at the distillery, you carved out two. 
And who knows if you're going to carve out three or four, you, you kind of just had a path. What I'm interested about though, is coming from Kentucky, living in Lexington, going to school at Transy. What was your exposure to bourbon before actually working at a distillery? Uh, the sorority bourbon was Jim Beam. Old Crow when, you know, your allowance or whatever was running low at the end of the month. My brother and his friends, my brother went to UK and then actually Belmont and Nashville. And they all, they drank makers. They were makers and Woodford drinkers at tailgates. So he was older, stole that a lot. But actually, I'll tell you, I fell in love with bourbon. I taught English in Japan for two years right out of college. I, I lived in Kobe, Japan. The bourbon bars in Japan were unbelievable. And it was the first time in my life I was making money. I was young. And that was where I really got my bourbon education, which is hilarious, right? Coming from Kentucky. But that Japan was where I really fell in love with bourbon and really started drinking. And it back then the pricing was weird. Like, you know, they would have all these weird Blantons and these weird Four Roses. And you would get these wild turkey exports back then that you didn't see. The Maker's Black Label was around back then. So there were all these bourbons you didn't have back home. Because the the Japanese export market was so specific and everybody did so much for them for so long. That was kind of where I really fell in love with bourbon. That's where most of my favorite things come from. KBD, pre-fire Heaven Hill things or, you know, will it but not will it like, uh, you know, pure antique or very old St. Nick's. But it was amazing juice that nobody here wanted and they had to sell it there just to you know, keep the lights on. Well, Four yeah. Roses, super premium. And then did you get to go to Gimor when you were out there? I don't know. I don't, I don't know what that is. I don't. We'll have to send you something because there is this whiskey bar in Japan. That's crazy. Where is it? Now, Roken was the big one. I went back and worked in Japan and there's, there's a few bourbon bars. Um, Ronin in Osaka was the first time I really drank pre-prohibition bourbon. That was like, my, I was boggled. Literally, it's just called Gimor, and like their sign says, based on what my friends have told me, they've been there. Like one side of the street says, "Do you want to drink whiskey?" Basically, and their side says, "We have Willet whiskey." <laughs> So moving on and kind of getting back to things, I kind of want to talk about the private select. You know, Rob had asked you to figure out how to do single barrels, and I find it really cool. Makers put staves in to finish, and that became the Makers Private Select program. And I've had other offerings from other distilleries that had staves in there, and it kind of gets artificially sweet. I've never felt that with a Private Select. So two questions here. Number one, how did that come about? What made you decide to use staves? And number two, how did you get it to not taste artificially sweet? Because that is the secret sauce. Private Select was born out of all the work we did with 46 and how we make whiskey at makers. And, I, and I'm always curious different distilleries approaches. And when I talk to, to people or, you know, friends at other distilleries, I'm always curious, like how... What's your approach? Because I think there's different ways to innovate and how Makers was created in the 50s is they started with a taste vision. He was a sixth generation bourbon maker. I'm not going to say distiller. He wasn't a distiller. He made bourbon and he leaned heavy on all of his friends in the industry to try to figure out the best process as possible. You ask him and he's like, I learned this from the Motlows and I learned this from the Shapiros and I learned this from the Beams and, you know... They started with a taste vision and 46 was created the same way. It was never about process. The process, we weren't married to the process. We were married to the taste vision. And so that stave process, it was something they found because he was chasing a really specific expression of makers that would become 46. So he wanted something bigger. He wanted it bolder. He wanted it spicier. He wanted a longer finish. And the thing is, we've, we've tried aging. Like, it's not like we've not tried aging. We're still trying in different ways and different capacities. And there's a lot of science into why we don't think makers necessarily taste good as it gets older. D opinions differ on that. With that experiment, they actually worked with the wine division of independent stave company. Our cooperage at the time did not have a research division for spirits at all. 
all their research was in wine and they made bourbon barrels and there were a few options of chars or seasonings, but they they weren't doing any innovation in the whiskey sector at all at that time. So they went to the wine division and wine uses chips and cubes and staves and powders and all this stuff. And they tried about 122 experiments and we looked at big barrels. We looked at quarter cask. We looked at all these things and the guardrails of 46 were it's got to come from makers. We're not doing a new mash bill and we don't want the flavor to come from an outside, another product, meaning we're not going to do a sherry finish. We're not going to do a Madeira cask. Those are wonderful products. They just, it's something we didn't want to do. He wanted it to be from agriculture. So once you had those guardrails, it really was, what can we do? And it was the amount of it was French oak and it was the amount of that surface area. We did barrels of French oak as well. We did double barrels. We did all this stuff. And those staves were just what worked. It clicked. It was the taste. So when it came time to do private select, we understood this tool, right? Like we understood how to work with these staves because we had been doing it for four years. And so the whole method behind private select, we were the last major distillery in Kentucky to do a single barrel program. We had avoided it for years because we felt like it would be disingenuous, right? Like if you are, if you're a distillery that goes to the the point of we're going to rotate 170,000 barrels in a warehouse this year for consistency. If I suddenly go, Oh, here are these barrels. They're, pick one. They're not, they're different, but they're not different. Like, the 10 Four Roses recipes, right? Like that's an amazing, here's 10 recipes and taste them. Like ours are like, this one maybe has a little more caramel. You know, I don't know because we're trying to make them taste the same. So when we went and started thinking about it, we, everything came out of 46 and that idea of we're not going to reinvent the wheel. We just want to make a different expression of makers. So that was how we came up with the idea how the actual science and the staves and all, I mean, it was just a ton of work. It was deconstructing makers and, and creating flavor camps and saying, we're going to go create virgin oak and we're going to cook it with independent stave and we're going to drive the whiskey into all these flavor camps. And then you get to Frankenstein your own barrel of bourbon together. Was any of it almost, I guess, a rebound? From the whole like, hey, we're going to lower the proof. Deep proofing was one of the greatest things that ever happened to us. It made us realize people cared and that we had to be thoughtful about choices we made as a brand and as a distillery. I think it was the wrong choice for the right reasons, right? The shelves were empty and you can lower the age. You can source the whiskey, which we have never done. We are a distillery who has never bought whiskey from anyone else, and we have never sold whiskey to anyone else in 66 years. It's probably the thing we're all most proud of. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just we've never done it. We are a single source supply. And then the other option was cut the proof. And it was literally we're going to add an ounce of water to every bottle. But we're going to tell them we're going to do it, and people lost their shit. Like, it, it was crazy. And we bottled it for four days. And then we said, oh, we think we screwed up. We should stop bottling this. <laughs> and I have three cases of 84 proof in my basement. I'm like, here's a little retirement plan. Um, but yeah, it was crazy. It, it did a couple of things. We said, okay, we have to be thoughtful. But it also made us realize if we're transparent with our consumers, they'll forgive our mistakes. Like we can make mistakes. It's okay to make mistakes. So that really, it was the catalyst that led to, all right, Let's be more thoughtful about what consumers actually want. And private select was something consumers wanted. Like we had retailers calling going, we want to buy barrels. And we said, we, we can't do a single barrel. It, it wouldn't, it would be disingenuous. And so we said, okay, let's stop saying we can't. And let's figure out how to do it in a way that makes sense for us. And this was private select was what made sense for us. So well, you weren't there when we did the, the blend with tart. The spiel Ryan gave us, and you know, like it's in the maker slide deck, but it was basically like Bill inherits a whiskey company, doesn't like the whiskey they make, sells it off, sells the distillery and everything, and then buys a whole new set of property, reinvents the wheel, and then is like, this is whiskey I like. What happened, as you know, during Prohibition, distilleries shut down. You're in the middle of the Great Depression. You look at Jim Bean, like everybody had to go usually get investors to get restarted. 
So they were no different. They got investors from Cincinnati. I can't remember their names right now. I'm sorry. They restarted the T.W. Samuels Distillery in 1934. Then when the war, when America joined the war in 41 and they started making, you know, weapon grade alcohol, all that stuff, the investors kind of came and said, we don't think this is working. He said, I don't even like the whiskey we're making. You're changing everything. And they basically decided we're going to part ways. So he actually decided to sell the brand, sold the distillery in 1943 and completely got out of the business for 10 years. And he had all these business ventures. So he bought what is now Maker's Mark. That distillery went bankrupt um, after prohibition because the stills were so small. Like everyone's like, why didn't you all make hand sanitizer? I'm like, our stills aren't big enough. Like we can't get to that proof. We have bourbon stills. They're not vodka still. Like we can't make, they're, our stills are small. We have 36 inch column stills for a two and a half million case brand. It's kind of crazy. That distillery went bankrupt. So when he decided to start over, he went looking at distilleries and this had a lake. It had a water source. It was 98 acres and it had all this great equipment that was all established in the 1940s. So he bought the Maker's Mark distillery for $35,000 in 1940. 53. And he started producing what would be Maker's Mark in 54. So yeah, I mean, it was, there was a lot of things, but he completely walked away from the family recipe and everything they had done before. So I want to go back because Zeke (laughs) went to a place that I wanted to touch on private select and stuff on that. And he's pulling stuff out of his ass tonight. So there's so much stuff that I wrote down that you said when you were talking about private select about how it can't be anybody else's project or it can't be in anybody else's product, you know, it's stuff from agriculture. What I really wrote down though, and I, I want to get your thoughts on this is the transparency. And I think that is key for the bourbon community right now. There's a lot of people that are sourcing juice and all whiskey people want, all the community wants is transparency. If you're putting something out there, I hate that there's so much ambiguity with some of the NDPs and their limited edition releases. And people are like, what is it? Is it Beam? Is it Barton? Where's it coming from? And then you have all the speculation. You guys kept it simple and just said, we're only doing our stuff. We're always only going to do our stuff. And here's everything we put into it. You know, I, I feel like the bourbon industry, and I've only been in it for 14 years. I feel like it is a transparent industry. I feel like people like to share information. But yes, I agree. There's a lot going on. But, you know, you got, you're got you down in Nashville, right? Bill me. Those guys are awesome. I love how transparent they are. Yeah, I mean, I think bourbon traditionally has been a fairly transparent industry, or at least my experience. We're not very good liars, so we just tell the truth, and then you don't get in trouble, typically. No, I love where you go with, it's only been 14 years. Like, uh, how long have we all been drinking bourbon? Seriously? I've been drinking for about 18, but if you know how old I am, I've really only been drinking bourbon for 15 years. I've been drinking bourbon a long time. I've been working and but bourbon's been keeping the lights on in, in Jane's house for 14 years. <laughs> Let's get to this year's limited edition makers and, and start talking about this a little bit. I found this interesting as I was doing some research. There are two people that work at makers that it's their job to produce yeast. That was in regards to an interview you gave as to last year's limited edition. But I found that fun fact. And so there's two people. All they do is make yeast. I don't know what skill like that does it. I don't know what else that transfers to. But yes, we have two people that make the yeast and makers mark. Is that part of your team as the innovation team? Like what other specialized stuff? No, that's a distillery job. So our distillery, you have five people that work a shift. You have a miller. You have a mash operator, you have a, a someone running the still, and then you have someone making yeast, and then someone that supervises that does all those jobs. So that's a distillery job, and it's a traditional job. So a lot of the heritage distilleries will still make jug yeast. They will still propagate from the jug. They will still do their own day yeast. Others have gone to dry yeast, or they're looking at hydrating, you know, I don't think there's a good or bad way. It's just, it's what works for your distillery and your product. If you're the Russells, you pull it out of your freezer. (laughs) 
I mean, you went from private select and then now you have these limited edition offerings. And as you said, y'all were kind of late to the party on these. We were very late to the party, fashionably late. So what drives these as you're kind of the getting to work with Denny and, and build these, what are you thinking about when you do a limited edition offering and what was your inspiration for this year's? So with these limited releases, we wanted to create expressions of makers that celebrated some of the choices that Bill and Margie made in the 50s. And I think the reason we started, honestly, one, people want them. It's fun. Two, we've learned a lot and we've we've experimented with a lot of different wood over the last six years and we've made some really delicious whiskeys. Why would we not bring people along on that journey? It seems crazy not to do that. Last year, we were uh, we wanted to make an expression of makers that let the yeast be the star of the show. The yeast never gets top billing. The barrel always gets top billing in bourbon. So this year, we this is really geeky, but we wanted to create an expression that paid tribute or kind of celebrated the fact that we still air dry all of our wood outside with Mother Nature for a year before it gets made into a barrel. When you're making a barrel of that's going to be used for bourbon production or maturation, there's a couple of levers the cooperage can pull for flavor. The thing that's so magical about white oak, it's quite flavor neutral when you cut it down. How you dry it and then how you cook it, it's going to create all this yummy flavor naturally. One of the things they do is instead of going into a dryer to pull the moisture out, we air dry it and it actually changes the chemistry of the oak. It's amazing. I don't know if you've ever been to a cooperage, but if you go through stacks, when you walk through, we have seven acres of Maker's Mark Wood sitting outside rotting in Marion County, Kentucky. And it's got mushrooms on it. It's got fungus. It's It looks gross. But as you walk through, it actually smells like marshmallows and cotton candy. It's amazing. Um, and it's breaking down. It's changing the building blocks of the oak. I mean, it's, it's changing the chemical and the chemistry of the oak. So this year's expression, we wanted to celebrate the fact that we do that and it's not normal to do that. And it's something we've done since the beginning and it makes a huge flavor impact to our whiskey. So what it does is it does a few things. Number one, it pulls out a lot of the tannins. So the first thing is we said, okay, we want to make an expression. We're going to use wood to make an expression that has less tannins. It's, well, it's crazy. Like that's just completely contradicting. But that was goal one. Goal two was we wanted to be big vanilla and big caramel because as you break down the oak and you break down the lignin and the hemocellulose, it creates natural vanillin and natural furfurols, which give you vanilla and caramel. So that was that was the goal this year is let's make an amped up vanilla caramel makers that is rich, it's creamy, it's coming together. There's enough spice to make it interesting, but it's tannin free. Denny and I laugh now, uh, 19 months after the fact, when we started this, we're like, this is going to be so easy. Uh, (laughs) Vanilla and caramel, like how basic, right? This is like bourbon 101. It's not the hardest project I've done personally, but it's close. And it's the first time we blend it. We never blended this way before. So we actually ended up, it is our first blended bourbon. It ended up being something totally different than what we expected. So how do you go into picking the proof? And this is something that Zeke and I always kind of question. The blend is hard enough to do. And I mean, I'd love to get your take on blending, but I know that we'd probably be here for another couple of hours as this is a whole other dorky topic. But do you just have a whole bunch of proofs lined up on the table? And then the one question we always have is, when is there a point where you can analyze your limited edition too much and you just have to walk away and say, I'm done. We do all of these at cask strength. Our cask strength is low because our entry proof is so low. We go into the barrel at 110 and because we rotate our cast strength is right around 110. So we just say, okay, we're going to let these be natural. Like we're going to give you the purest expression of this whiskey. So we're going to leave them at cask strength. With 46 at 94 proof, that was Bill. That was his sweet spot. So that one's an interesting whiskey. If you've ever tasted 46 at cask strength, I freaking love it. It's like figs and almonds and tobacco and caramel. At 94 proof, it's more vanilla and cinnamon. So 
he wanted the vanilla and cinnamon. Like that was his jam. He actually hates it at cask strength. So to celebrate his 80th birthday, we actually bottled some at cask strength and like, we're going to do this whole thing just to piss him off. But uh, (laughs) proof is just an avenue for flavor. So for these limited, we just leave them at cask strength. And then for me, so I actually wish Denny were here because he, this project, he'd be like, it's good. Like we're done. Like it's not done. It's not done. Like we have to keep, so I can't walk away till it's literally like in the vat, ready to go to bottling. Like even this one, uh, we made extra barrels and we were tweaking. We batted it for four weeks and we left it in vat and we were tasting every two days because when you start with the taste vision, this sounds fanatical but when you start with the taste vision it becomes very objective and less about what I like and what I don't like and it really is you've got this idea in your head what it's supposed to taste like you feel obsessive about it until it's there and so this one like I think we did as good as we could it drinks like butter pecan ice cream which was kind of the goal it was tweaking till the last minute. And then I'm kind of like, okay, it's done. What's next? I need to learn that. Okay. When do you leave it and go? Like, I always feel like it could probably be better. No, I'm with you. Like, um, it's when somebody lets you help blend and you start tasting and you get those nuances and then literally it's like, all right, here's what we put together. But I swear, like I can identify this and this and like these little congeners. And I think if we tweaked it a little bit to like this side of the curve and then just a little more of this one, like it it might be money. I'm with you. Like you can't rest until you know if it's there or not. It's painful. I mean, it (laughs) it really is. I also think like, how do you know if you went far enough if you don't go too far? (laughs) Like, I'm with you. It's the like, same thing. Go too far, and then you can pull it back. But I always feel like, how do you know if you ever went far enough if you don't do it? You never know until you ask. <laughs> I also just want to mention, as a side note, you know, you're sitting here saying that you can't be a distiller because you don't know the lingo and the stuff <laughs> that you've been busting out. I mean, in 14 years, you've picked up a lot. I'm sorry. It's who I. It's the company I keep. I guess. <laughs> people make the juice and then people put the juice together that's two different skills Yo. now zeke what did you think of this year's limited edition there are kind of crazy names like sr 71 like what is this year's release number it's some code word it's the 2020 release <laughs> <laughs> thank you yeah we are not good at naming stuff we've just kind of leaned in margie samuels was good at naming stuff she named maker's mark we've all been terrible ever since it it went downhill when they put the i on the wrong side of the v oh yeah because it was should have been sbi instead of siv yep (laughs) nailed it we used two different staves this year one was a pr5 stave it was american oak it was kind of the vanilla stave they cooked it seasoned it a long time convection low and slow so that stave we actually aged the whiskey for four weeks with that wood and about 55 percent of the blend was that whiskey and then the other save was that se4 save and it was french oak that was more of the furperol or caramel stave and actually we made two batches of bourbon with it we did 32% of the blend was that stay for five weeks. And then the rest, the 13% was that stay for six weeks. Because what happened in that week is it went from like a creamy, I always say it's like my grandma's caramel. It was like creamy, buttery caramel to my grandmother's caramel, which she just throws sugar in a cast iron and burns the hell out of it. And it was more like burnt caramel, right? So you had these two caramels at play. And that six week, that 13% gave it, we were at the two saves forever and it was good. It was just so boring. And so we just needed something. And so adding that 13%, giving it a week longer, it gave it this spice and this backbone and just a little more depth um, that really just kind of brought it all together. So it's two saves, but three different batches of bourbon, if that makes sense. Totally get it. Zeke, what did you think about this limited? I had this, I'm having it now, honestly, and uh, I had it back when we had the pick for the blend with, uh, you know, Tark and 
it stood out to me. Like I thought it was really good. The the questions I would have are simply regarding the stave finishes. Have you noticed certain staves or profiles that seem to change or fall off with airtime? With airtime, meaning bottle head space or in the actual glass? Bottle head space, simply the the blends or the, the stay finishes that I've had that I thought were exceptional. Naturally, you, know, you kind of bogart those things and then you go back to it like a month later. And it's like, oh, this ain't what I had. Like, it, it's not as good. Like, what did I miss out on? Having that happen more than, you know, once or twice, I've got to where, like, if I get one of these stay finishes that, you know, somebody does, I'm like, all right, this has a week for me and my friends. And after that, like, it it needs to be done. I don't want to miss the profile that I enjoy. So interesting, because I agree with you to an extent, and I think this is subjective. I tell people these need a little bit of headspace. Like, I don't. Trying to think, yeah, probably a third of the way down is when they start drinking really great to me. It depends on what you like, though. I think I agree with you, Zeke. Like, you open these, and because it's castrate and because of how much flavor we've packed in there, it's a lot. Like, out of the gate, you open these bottles and they're intense. And so, when you start drinking, like RC6 last year's release, when it got just a little bit of headspace, it was just amazing. To your point, it's really, to me, they change quickly and it's the amount of flavor. I find that with older whiskeys and I find it with cast strength. I learned it the hard way on a 30 year old Laphroaig that I was trying to like stretch out. <laughs> and then we went back and I'm like, oh shit, it's gone. So I'm, we're the same. The rule in our house is if you open it, you better drink it pretty much within a year. And older stuff, you better drink quicker. So I, yeah, I mean, I, and I think it's a personal preference. There's some whiskeys I like as the bottle starts going down and others start to lose their luster a little bit. Yeah. And I don't know if it is, you know, based on the staves and that, that changes the dynamics and the chemistry of the juice. That's just been my experience. I tell people, like, if you get one you love, share it with all your friends, call it, like, call them, tell them to come over. Like, this has got to go. We got 10 days. I find certain finishes like a cognac finish. It's one of those ones you got to open that bottle and invite some friends over because you got about five to seven days before it's going to drink completely different i think it just depends like there are certain wines that i think go quicker than others but i do find it interesting that with makers with the staves i think that that would probably give you a little bit more time because it's not as much surface area probably that is the majority of it is probably just the regular charred oak and the stave is just a portion of that opposed to being the the whole barrel that was finished in something else or am i reading into that way too much no you need to do one of these picks man like you have to do the blend it's amazing and i'll say that simply it had been offered to us before and literally it was like ah, i can't drive to kentucky and help do this blend and then find my way home there'll be blue lights involved probably well but i just think it's so cool because it's crafting and the experience i would love to do it but the way that you talked about it to me and i don't want to steal your thunder but zeke has this big desire to blend and I think Maker's Private Select is probably the closest he's going to get. Now, there are other picks out there where you can actually do a blend, but I think Private Select is the only chance he's really going to get to tinker the way that he really wants to tinker. I mean, it was just fun. I mean, it was a blast. Come, to, yeah, come see me sometime. To sit there and tinker and like, all right, well, what if we did this or that? And, you know, it's like Pandora's box. The more you think about it, the worse it gets because you're never going to find an answer. I, I think that's the like caveat to it is like the more you think about it, this is going to get worse for you. <laughs> I will ask very simply, what do you think of P2? And that's a loaded question. <laughs> so you got to remember, I spent two years with these whiskeys before we launched that program. So they're like my children. Here's what I would say about P2. That save at four weeks is unbelievable. So the vanilla comes out really at two to four weeks. 
I've been working for five years to try to make a P2 that has all that vanillin and lignin without the tannins, and it's not going to happen. <laughs> so I love it. I love the brightness of it. It's the closest to floral we ever get. It's like sour apples to me, that save. Um, I wish the tannins were a little less. I love it. I, you have to know how to use it. It's a very specific save. And I guess I can tell you guys, we're actually getting ready to introduce a new save into the program. It's been interesting to see because we study like the HPLC and the analytics of these saves a lot to try to understand what we're pulling out of them. But I love the P2 save. You just have to know how to use it, I think. What Do you not like it or do you like it or what? Not your favorite? I mean... P2 and I, we're, we're not good friends. There, there's just an element that literally every maker's select pick I've had that has that in there. It's the first thing I notice, and I immediately just want to walk away. I find it really interesting because you had brought up Four Roses earlier, how y'all aren't Four Roses but at the same time, yes, you're not using yeast and yes, you're not using Mashbow for it. But I think the private select program is just as much like Four Roses because you are getting a menu and Four Roses has 10 things on their menu you can order. But there's almost more flexibility in private select as you do develop more staves and introduce more staves you'll have this menu and then you can even mix and match within the available staves so you're the amount of different blends you can make or the amount of different products you can make from those staves then multiplies and it's endless it's a thousand and one right now it's true but it, it wasn't a prejudice like when did the blend with tarp and I asked Ryan, I was like, hey, like there's something that you guys have that I, I just can't agree with. I don't know what it is. Like, let's taste through everything. And, you know, he had them all uh, individual staves. But the minute it hit, I was like, oh, like that's the one. Like, and I asked him, I was like, do you get feedback from people that says their picks or their selections or whatever change with air? Same as I told you, I was just like, I've had some of these that I loved and the downside, the loving one was that I tried to like hide or bogart it and save it for me and my friends. And then when we came back to it, I was like, ah, oh, this is not the mix that I was in love with. And ever since then, I was just been like, all right, if I get a maker select that I love like one week, that's all it's got. For so those weird. of you that are listening, I just want to jump in here for a second. Tark is the owner of Elixir Spirits in Spring Hill, Tennessee, and Ryan is the maker's rep for the state of Tennessee. Zeke is talking like you all know who they are. You should know Tark, but Ryan, you might not know. Ryan Megan's amazing. He's our diplomat in Tennessee, and he's amazing. I have a question for you. You've basically challenged me to find a P2 makers that you're going to like. Tell me some of your favorite whiskeys and why you like them. And I'm going to blend you something and you're going to like it. My favorite whiskeys would literally be pre-Fire Heaven Hill. If, if I don't have to think or work too much. And very old St. Nick that tastes like creme brulee. He loves that too. Creme brulee. So John was with me a year or two ago when I, I cracked a very old... <laughs> Very old, old St. Nick. It was a 20-year bottle. As soon as we pulled the cork out, it just smelled like Mississippi mud. Like, you know, the, the confection, like the dessert thing? Yeah. I mean, that was it. He and I are standing there in my kitchen, and I'm like, do you smell this? And he's like, yeah, dumbass, I smell it. And then I just keep asking him, because I'm like, this is amazing. The funny thing about Zeke and I is that we both gravitate towards sweet whiskey our palates are so different that what i consider sweet he considers hot and what he considers sweet i consider hot like our palates are opposite but we both are looking for a similar thing in a whiskey that would be my my jam in a nutshell is if you've ever had pre-fire like you get the profile it, it it's just unique i don't think i've had a ton of pre-fire but i heard you say confectionery i heard you say creme brulee I heard you say sweet. Now, you're the DNA of your palates and the homes you have on your palates for different things are different. Awesome. But I'm going to send you, I'm going to send you some samples of some stuff. 
I have something I want to propose, and I don't know if you can make this happen. Okay. We don't need to go through a store. We don't need the barrel. What we would rather do is go up and make a private select with you, and you all can sell it in the gift shop. Like, we don't care. You could do the Jane's Dad's Drinking Bourbon Blend, and we don't need it. We just want to They're never letting me do that, but I would love that. (laughs) I mean, if they're listening, maybe somebody, it's a great marketing opportunity if you're listening at the brand. I think there would be a line at the distillery for it, and people should do it. So what I would, I would what love would to have you guys come up and just have a day of tasting some stuff, letting you taste some big time failures that you do taste the process. We give them, um, we usually name them like we've got like the Marion County Fair. It's like cotton candy and cigarettes. We've got <laughs> like, I mean, some of these, you know, 99% of what we experiment with tastes terrible. So I mean, it, it, the what, cause you're, it's, the wood is so flavorful. Like to your point earlier, it's how do you make it feel integrated and you can't taste how the sausage is made is what I would say. Like you don't want to taste the wood influence. You want to taste the whiskey. That was, that was our goal. Like we had to pick, like luckily I, I still have the, the random little book thing. Well, we came up with empirically and somehow it, it held true through five different other selection, like choice things. It was um, 346, three French mocha, and four French spice. Ooh, that's a mouthful of bourbon. Kind of wrapping this up, and I don't want to go too far into this. I know that there is a new label that was actually just submitted to TTB yesterday. So I think this is a great question to ask. What does the future hold for limited releases at Maker's Mark? And what else do you have in that brain of yours? So we have a lot of fun things coming down the pipeline. We spend a lot of time looking at agriculture. We spend a lot of time looking at our ingredients. I'll tell you the most fun I've had in a long time. Um, we have a product. It's not going to be on the market. We're doing it 100% to raise money. We barrel vat it. Do you guys know much about barrel vatting? So I couldn't find a lot about it. I remember meeting the master blender of famous grouse like 10 years ago. He's like, naked grouse, we barrel vat. I'm like, what's barrel vatting? And we actually just did a blend of 34 private select barrels from around the country. And then we vatted them. And then we put them back in barrels, back in our cellar. And we were making this whiskey that's coming out. It's It's unlike anything I've ever tasted at Maker's. So I'm excited about that. It's called our community batch and we're doing it to try to raise half a million dollars for the Lee initiative to feed hospitality workers right now. So that's coming. And then next year's limited release, just putting the final touches and, you know, everyone's palettes are different. I will say it's probably my favorite thing we've ever made at Maker's Mark. So I'm excited. It's, it's a Jane, it's a Jane drink. Well, the 2020 is Denny Potter's palette all over. I like it. I'm not a caramel vanilla girl. Like that's not my jam. This is really good. Denny Potter, like I, he basically is like, what do we think I need? I need to buy to get me through like five years with this whiskey. I'm like, we could just make more. Um, but yeah. So he, what is a Jane palette then? What kind of things should we look forward to? I like dried fruit. I like pruney tobacco notes. I like spice, but not like beat me over the head with it. I like a str- a little bit of astringency. Like that's my palate. So you like the cigar pour. That's what I like to say. Is like, that what it's called? Well, I that pour sounds like it pairs perfectly with the cigar, you know, because it's like a little it, bit dry. It's got the tobacco and leather. Yeah. I want like figgy, rainy, raisiny, like, I love, like, dry, like, 46 cats. I love that pour. It's got, and I like it. I mean, it depends on the season, right? You know, one of my favorite summertime pours we do is a heavy mix of P2 with that spice stave, and it's like honeysuckles. It's what it drinks like, right? So I think it's just seasonal. I'm going to make you that. You're looking at me like I'm crazy. I'm, I'm more than intrigued to see something with P2 that I enjoy. It's literally like... Do you like Japanese whiskeys? Not really. No? Some of the Mizu stuff, I can appreciate and enjoy, but I, I think for the most part, 
the majority of them try to mimic scotch because that's what they were taught and that's just not my jam and and honestly i mean when we did the the stay finish thing when we came in i was just like i don't know what this is but there is something some element to this process that i can't get behind and i was like whatever it is like i don't know i just want to find it and then not have it here but that's where p2 was for me i I just even like we tried one blend at one you know stave out of the 10 and i was just like oh there must be something you're super sensitive to in that stave it could very well be me Anything good is what he's sensitive to. (laughs) Well, I just want to say I so appreciate you coming on. You, by far, have already been one of my favorite guests, and I really want to geek out more and come up and visit, and we got to plan something for early in 2021, but I'm happy to call you a friend now. You are welcome on this show anytime you want to come on. Zeke, do you want to say anything to her before we we give her... We let her go to bed. I just have to ask, are you kin to David Bowie? I don't. Bowie's my very name, so I, I don't know. I, you are such I, a The dumbass. Diller I'm still a Connor. Like, the Bill and Rob have refused to accept that I have a different name. Uh, Zeke, so, what the hell kind of question was that? She's married, and, like, she, how do you know she's... David Bowie's English. My husband's English, so maybe. John, oh. there's a thing. It's called You Never Know Until You Ask. Dumbass. Actually, Bowie's an, a big Irish name. My father-in-law's from Ireland, so I don't know. That has nothing to do with David Bowie. David Bowie's from England. So yeah, now you try and fake it. You put your hands up like you think you know something, but you don't know shite. <laughs> Look here, Jesus doesn't want me for a sunbeam. That, that was a David Bowie song that Nirvana covered that was awesome. <laughs> Anyways, it has been an absolute pleasure to have you on. I know that you have a four-year-old just like I have a four-year-old. It is time for you to go to bed because they're going to wake up early, I'm sure. Yo. Well, thank you all so much. This was really fun. I hope to see you guys soon. Yes, we'll set it up and, and we'll reach out to you. Thank you for everything. Thank you all. Thank you. Zeke, the folks can find us on Facebook at Dad's Drinking Bourbon, Twitter at Bourbon Dads, Instagram at Dad's Drinking Bourbon. Find us wherever you download your podcast. Chances are you already have because you are listening to us right now. Leave us an open and honest review like we leave open and honest reviews about the whiskey we drink. Zeke, where else can the folks find us? Go Nashville, Tennessee. Cheers. Ciao.